Asia, thank you. COVID-19 cases are skyrocketing in the Kansas City area, leaving hospitals short on space. This morning, we're joined live with Dr. Dana Hawkinson at the University of Kansas Health System to look more into this. So, doctor, just in your hospital alone, we've talked about patients with acute infections has more than doubled over the last two weeks. The number of people in intensive care has doubled. As more people get infected, we know that you have talked about in your daily updates that hospitalizations also follow a rise in cases. Looking two to three weeks down the road, truly, what do you see happening if we continue on this same path? Yeah, I think the number of hospitalizations for acute illness is going to increase, um, just as the cases did, you know, two to three weeks later uh, or further out is when we see the increase in hospitalizations. And then, of course, after that, uh, death as well. So all of those things lag behind the acute infections. Um, again, we've always said that 80 to 85 percent of people will never need to seek medical care. Unfortunately, when you have such high numbers of infections, even those small percentages become very large numbers. We certainly are anticipating that. We would like um, if our hospital didn't get filled up with new acute infections, but we are taking precautions and anticipating that right now, as are other hospitals and health systems around the metro area as well. And doctor, hearing these rising numbers can be very, very alarming. Has it gotten to the point where we need to reconsider doing those simple tasks, such as going to the grocery store? You know, that's difficult to say. I think the first thing is, as we've talked about um, before, is the individual behavior. We do need to go to the grocery stores. That's why it, it is so important that um, everybody do their individual responsibility and not meet in the large groups, in the private homes, um, groups uh, of 10 or more, and sometimes even less, you can still have other infections. But doing that so that we can't, we don't have to spread the disease in that manner because we need to go to the grocery store. We need all of our supply chain drivers to be well and to drive. We need our police officers and our firefighters and our EMT and everybody else that does those everyday menial services that we don't really think about but are so vitally important. So it's important for everybody to take that individual responsibility, and especially now with um, Thanksgiving just around the corner and people wanting to meet and be with friends and be with family. I understand that, but, but right now in this climate with the infection spreading as it is, that's a very um, dangerous task to be doing. Yeah, that's frightening that we're talking about this now before we've even gotten to the week of right. Thanksgiving. So we want to talk yeah. about some good news in the pandemic. Biotech company Moderna says early analysis from their phase three trial shows their vaccine is more than 94 percent effective at preventing infection. And now we have two vaccines along with Pfizer that are really seeing more than 90 percent efficacy, at least in their early results. If we start to see we know there are other companies researching and going through trials. If we start to see another company or two come on with that same kind of of positive result. Does that up our timeline even further of when we could get vaccines? You know, the timeline is mostly going to be decided by when the final analysis was done. Both the Pfizer and the Moderna information is from interim analysis. So they had a time point where they stopped to look at everything. So we have to see when that final analysis is done because we've talked about how important it is to be transparent, to show that these vaccines are safe to take. And then secondly, of course, they are efficacious. So certainly this new interim analysis for both Pfizer and Moderna do show that they are fairly um, efficacious. And we understand that really this technology with the MRA, mRNA is quite um, safe as well. So far, there have really been no um, safety problems with this. So I think we need to wait for the final analysis. And I'm not sure exactly when those final dates will be. But then we need to be transparent and put it out there for the public to see so that we can all get on the same page, have the same message, and then understand what to expect once the vaccines are available. I don't know how much you might know about this, but just in, in listening to what we've been talking about, the differences in the two vaccines that we've talked a lot about the last couple of days, um, how can they be so different? For instance, one needs to be refrigerated at extreme temperatures and one doesn't. If they're fighting the same virus, that might not be a short mm -hmm. answer, but just a little bit. Yeah, I, I think that's just the way that they're produced and the way that they're able to be um, stabilized. So certainly they are both what we call mRNA vaccines. So RNA is part of the genomic material. Once that's injected into the body, your cells are actually able to take 
that genetic material and make the spike protein or make the area or the region of the spike protein so that you can then present it to your immune cells to create um, the antibodies and the T cell responses towards that. So it could be just differences in the production, maybe specific details in the, um, the delivery mechanism as well, uh, you know, how the mRNA is delivered into your body that really lends it to the, the significant t temperature differences that you've talked about. But again, every um, company has their own proprietary methods for creating these vaccines. Um, and that is probably why in those details you see such a dichotomy of the, the very, very low temperatures compared to the, hmm. the low temperatures that most clinics have for other vaccines. That's fascinating. Are, by the way, are you surprised at the over 90% efficacy so far? You know, I am. It's, it's very encouraging, especially when we have two of them. Uh, yeah. What they saw, especially in the Moderna, is that 90 people who had gotten the placebo got infected, but only five people who got the actual vaccine got infected. And that's how they came up with that 95% efficacy when they compared the number of infections in the placebo group versus the number of infections in the group that got the vaccine. Wow. Wow. Thank you so much, yeah. Dr. Hawkinson, mm -hmm. and appreciate you joining us Thank as you. always.